Our second reading for this day is from Luke 21, beginning at verse 5. Listen again for God's word to you. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must place, take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues and great signs and portents in heaven. This is God's reading to us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When you walk into this worship space, what do you see? You may notice the stained glass windows first. You might notice how it opens up in a, what's called a, a modified Akron plan so that there's extra space for seating. You might notice that window Today I noticed the star that's hung newly, getting ready for seasons we're about to go into. You might notice the beautiful architecture and the, the color of the wood and the warmth of the pews and the chairs in the back. What's in a worship space and how compelling it is to the eye is important. It sends significant messages to us. It tells us something about what is being proclaimed and a lot about how it is put forth. The Protestant reformers understood very well the power of symbols. That's why they wanted only a few and only the most important ones. Always a table for communion, whether the feast is celebrated that day or not, to remind us every day of the meal that nourishes the faithful. Always a font for baptism, whether or not one is scheduled, to remind us every day of our baptism and the difference that it makes. This afternoon, because it's the 50th anniversary of my baptism, we're going to move the bowl up and actually have water in it. Again, a symbol of the fact that all we do is rooted in our baptismal promises. There is always a pulpit for proclaiming the word to remind us of the importance of scripture for daily living. And if the pulpit is not always front and center, the Bible most certainly is. Add to those sometimes a cup and plate on the table, water in the font, Bibles in the pews, perhaps a cross someplace. These are the essentials. These are the focal points for worshipers. Beyond that, the other things that draw our attention, like the stained glass windows, instruct, amplify, explain, or teach. They tell us what else to pay attention to, what beyond the fundamentals should grab hold of us. In European cathedrals, it's not uncommon for there to be a significant mosaic or a painting high up in the ceiling, over the apse, in the dome, overlooking the chancel or, or the main part of the church, perhaps. The subject up there is often the risen Christ, the ruler of the world, arms outstretched as wide as the church itself. 
reigning in glory, done in white and gold. Imagine walking into the worship space and seeing a shining representation of the glory-filled Christ, glittering with every bit of light. It sends the message that what is proclaimed from the pulpit and celebrated at the table and the font has something to do with that risen and reigning Christ who rules over all the world. Now that's not something that we very readily see in our daily existence. When you walked outside this morning, did you see Christ in the clouds with arms outstretched, ruling the world? Probably not. You probably saw snow. (laughs) And when you listened to the weather report, did you hear a forecast for rain, R-E-I-G-N? No, we heard about lake effect snow. As we go about our daily tasks, we simply aren't very aware of Christ's rule over all things. And yet, Scripture says that it is an ever-present reality. God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Because this rule of Christ is so cosmic, it is the theological climax of the church year. Today is Reign of Christ Sunday, or Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday in the liturgical year. Next Sunday, it's a new year. Next Sunday, we start telling the Christian story all over again, beginning with the first Sunday in Advent, thinking about promise and hope and expectation. Next week, we will again be pointed toward the fulfillment that we celebrate today, which you may say is all fine, well, and good, but how do we orient our lives around something that is so hard to see? and so hard to get our heads around. Well, sometimes we get a glimpse of a reality that is fundamental in importance on which everything else in our lives is based. And that glimpse sustains us for the long haul through all the experiences that seem to contradict it until the next glimpse comes. Take, for example, the parents of an extremely disturbed child who spends much of their time hitting and screaming, biting and cursing, injuring themselves and others. But every now and then, there are moments of shared love and tenderness. Those moments, those glimpses of something more fundamental are what keeps the family going through the next long bouts. So let me share two stories in which I think we can glimpse and receive sustenance from the reign of Christ. In my first year of graduate school, my first year out of graduate school, I lived in San Diego, where I was enrolled in a training orchestra through the US International University. The conductor was Hungarian, and he had a very interesting vision for a chamber orchestra made up of young musicians from all over the world. In reality, the largest number came from the Republic of China. Now, this was 1987-88. It was before China became what it is today. It was before the Tiananmen Square showdown. It was still when we talked about mainland China uh, because most of the Chinese who were here came from Hong Kong. Well, my roommate that year in Beijing, in San Diego, was from Beijing. Her name was Zheng Li, and she was a violinist from a family of violinists. She was also a Christian. During the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, her family had hidden their Bibles and their violins. 
but neither word nor music had left them. In time, they would resurrect the violins and play again. As for the church in China, it flourished underground. The desperate social conditions heightened the need to rely on God, and people came to faith in droves. In a time of drought and need, Christ was raining many blessings upon the Chinese people. So Zhongli came to this country with faith intact and she found a Chinese Christian church in San Diego to worship with. Eight years later, I traveled to China with 30 Presbyterians to attend the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women. We also spent a week traveling to churches and meeting with their leaders. One of those leaders explained to us that in the 1950s, the church was dominated by Western missionaries, and he said it was a situation of shepherds, those missionaries, looking for sheep, parishioners, church members. Then the church had to go underground. And when they resurfaced, the situation was very different. Now it was sheep, all those members, looking for shepherds. The Protestant church in China reorganized so that it was very much a Chinese church, one run and led by Chinese. The seminaries reopened not all that long before my visit, and they were busily educating those shepherds to take care of all those sheep. The Amity Printing Company was producing scads of Bibles, hymnals, and study books for use among all those sheep. And in Shanghai, the largest church was holding several overflowing services on a Sunday and baptizing hundreds on Easter. Six years after that, the main Protestant seminary, Nanjing Theological Seminary, accepted a couple of Americans as guest faculty members. One of those was Carolyn Higginbotham, who was a dean at my seminary in Indianapolis. She planned seminary-sponsored trips to China and brought a student or two from Nanjing to this country. When you look at that whole history, it is clear that Christ's rule has been at work throughout the years. Even when it looked like Chairman Mao had the reins of power, he didn't. Not really. The real power was Christ, who reigns mightily. The other story comes from the other side of the globe, from Coventry Cathedral in England. Many of you will be familiar with that story, and some of you may have visited it. If you have, you've probably found the experience indelibly seared in your memory. The original cathedral was built in the 14th century, but on one tragic night in 1940, it was destroyed by fire from Nazi bombs that rained down on the city of Coventry. All that remained were the blackened outer walls, and as if by a miracle, the magnificent 295-foot-high tower and spire. An open competition was held to determine the architect on whose plan the new cathedral would be built or, and, and what they would do. Sixteen years later, a new foundation stone was laid, and the building was consecrated. What is so magnificent is that the old is included in the new. The main entrance is right between the old and the new. In the sanctuary, the most poignant piece is both a relic and a daring statement. It is a cross made from two charred roof beams, and the words, Father, forgive, are carved into the stones behind. At the foot of that cross is another cross made from two of the 14th century hand-forged nails, which rained down from the roof 
as the old cathedral perished. It looked that night in 1940 like Hitler reigned, but he didn't. Not really. Christ was reigning mightily and reigns still. Coventry Cathedral stands as a magnificent testimony to that reality. In addition to the poignant cross, there are splendid works of contemporary art that testify to the power of God to raise us from the dead. Overlooking the main entrance on the facade of the building is a huge bronze sculpture depicting St. Michael standing over the devil in victory. Inside, behind the baptismal font, is a floor-to-ceiling window. It's made of glass in an array of abstract colors, and the patterns form a central area which is white. It represents the inextinguishable light of the Holy Spirit. And finally, above and behind the altar is a tapestry depicting Christ in glory. Like its predecessor images in similar locations, it makes no bones about the reality of Christ's cosmic reign. Christ is large, hands lifted up, and in between his feet, carefully protected, is the figure of a person, and underneath and to the side are all things of heaven and earth. There can be no doubt about who reigns, in Coventry. In 1940, the nighttime forecast in Coventry called for rain. Bombs and fire and nails and beams raining down. It also called for rain, R-E-I-G-N, Christ's reign, which was and is and is to be world without end. May the Father forgive us when we confuse the forecast. <laughs>